Next topic item, public services, one of the items that's, that's on that board. Um, so for public services, we can do a wide range of activities, right? Services. Uh, we have job training, substance abuse, uh, senior meals, child care. I mean, the list is endless. What are some of the public services? I'm assuming most of you fund public services. Give me some examples of some public services that you, you implement. After school. After school. Literacy. Literacy. Other? Better women's shelter. Better women's shelter. Mm -hmm. women shelter. I'm glad you brought that one up, by the way. So, battered and abused, domestic violence we call it, right? Domestic violence types of activities. This is one of the unique activities under public service because one of the things that happens when you are, number one, it is a presumed category, right? So you're not requiring income of those individuals. However, there is a regulate, there's a law or some type of regulation that prohibits the disclosure of information of victims of domestic violence. Okay, so this is where it's unique as a public service program and it's good you brought it up because it's good for everybody to know this if you ever do fund a domestic violence program. Number one, the address, if they provide you with a physical address, we're gonna see an IDIS where we can actually not make that visible to anybody, okay? I will tell you that most domestic violence uh, agencies will only provide you a P.O. box number, okay? Secondly, when you go out to monitor them, okay, be respectful of that client privilege that they have and what but this is a best practice that we have is we tell them in advance when we're going to go out to monitor, please label all of your applicants, all your cases as 1 through 20. Just give it a number. Perfect. Then you're sitting on one side of the table, they're sitting on the other side of the table, and you're starting to ask them questions. Okay. Applicant number 18, race, ethnicity, just to make sure that did you collect everything, right? Did they, you're not asking income because it's not one of the, the elements. Okay, did you provide services? When did you provide services? Okay, what were they for? So that now you, when you're doing the financial and the programmatic monitoring, that you can connect the dots, right? Okay, they provided services, they billed me for services, okay. But please be respectful of that, you know. Um, and that's, that's, Everybody understands the situation, and that's okay. So thank you for bringing up domestic violence. Any other types of activities that, that you implement? Okay. Absolutely. Food show. Good. Okay. So as you can see, there is a variety of programs that are being run. And there's a couple of things that, that we need to make sure that we are doing a better job, uh, that we do a better job of reporting accomplishments and working with your subrecipients on this. And this is a pet peeve of mine. As, as we all know, part of the, the whole CDBG bus budget issue uh, has stemmed around, well, what are they doing? It's not effective, right? Have you heard that? And part of the reason is that as grantees, we don't do a very good job of making sure that subrecipients are telling their story. And we, we use this term all the time, tell your story, tell your story. And I'm going to give you an example of what really telling your story is. So we fund, and there's a community we work with, 
we fund, ironically, a Meals on Wheels program that it was said is not an effective use of CDBG funds, right? We actually fund a Meals on Wheels program. The program assists 165, approximately between 165 and 175 seniors on an annual basis, okay? And so when you're reporting in IDIS, you're saying we're assisting 175 seniors. We're providing meals on wheels. So we know in IDIS you have an opportunity to put in narratives. This is where you need to tell your story. And so our story was not only do we provide meals for 175 seniors, throughout the year, a total of 25,000 meals are provided to those 175 seniors. So what's more impressive, 25,000 meals or 175 seniors? Okay, you see how Telling the whole story really changes the appearance of that activity, even though we didn't do anything. We just said, we, we told the whole story. It's up to you, the grantees, to make sure that that story is being told on all of your activities. So when, when we talk about IDIS tomorrow, in that narrative box, I always say, you know, you want them to report on a quarterly basis, you know, the who, what, why, when, and where's of their program. What did you do this quarter? When did you do it? Why did you do it? Who did you do it for? Okay. And we're not talking about a thesis project. It could be one paragraph long, but they can provide you with that information, and that's how you tell your story. And it's up to all of us to do that to avoid people saying this program is inefficient. It really is not. It's a fantastic program and I see it all the time. I can't tell you how often we get somebody who comes and gives us a hug because we just repaired their house. We, we replaced their water heater, you know. Uh, they're bringing a cake to City Hall, right, because they're just so grateful. We're not doing a good job of telling that story. Nah, again, that's my, my, I'm standing on my soapbox. Okay. Um, we can also provide some, some housing related services, housing counseling, fair housing council. And by the way, how many of you actually fund your fair housing program with public service dollars? Okay. How many of you fund it with administration dollars? So this is one of those activities that you can fund either or, okay? We find communities that um, have a dire need for admin to cover the administrative costs and they'll choose to put pub the uh, uh, fair housing under a public service. Some that you, know, you have plenty of admin money so you'll actually fund them under admin, freeing up public service dollars that are very competitive as well, right? Yes? Well, so what happens is you have, an ad, you have um, fair housing services. You can put it under your admin category or your public service category. Now, which one do you want to impact? The, the difference being that if I fund under admin, I don't have to obtain anything from that fair housing agency. Uh, typically, we request all of the beneficiary data anyways, and we put it in the narrative. But if you're going to use public service cap money, your 15%, then it must meet a national objective, right? low mod clientele, now guess what? They must collect income data for all the individuals that they're assisting. So 
in that your case, it's a matter of which funds you want to use, admin or public service. So th that's one of the activities that you can kind of, if you're in need of public service money, you might put it to admin. If you're in need of admin money, you may put it public service, but know that if it is public service, now you have, they must meet a national objective. Whereas if you fund it under admin, there is no national objective requirement. Admin is NA, okay? All right, so we also can do, so com for community services, we're looking at uh, education, recreation services, public safety. Key item to take into account, when you are setting this up in IDIS, and I'll repeat this tomorrow when we are going over IDIS, always select the most appropriate uh, matrix code for that activity. So public services fall under matrix code 05. And 05 is basically a general public service. And then there are multiple public services. Let me get that one sheet. Uh, multiple public services underneath 05. As an example, 05C is legal services, right? <coughs> so if you're providing legal services, you wouldn't use 05, you would use 05C. And it's a pretty extensive list. So it goes from 05A, 05 and 05A to 05W. Gives you an idea of how many different options there are. And the reason I say that is depending on which matrix code you choose, it will determine what questions IDIS is going to ask you to fill out, what you need to report on, okay? And we'll talk about IDIS as well tomorrow, but one of the best practices that I can recommend when we're talking about funding public service or any other type of activity is go into IDIS when you initially set it up and then do screenshots of every page because that's going to tell you what data you must collect, right? And then you can pass that along to Public Works, you can pass that along to the Housing Division, you can pass that along to the Public Service Agencies and say, this is the data that you must be reporting to me uh, so that I can then take it and put it into IDIS. Most of you probably are not involved with the actual rehab work, right? So you're relying on somebody else to give you that information but you need to let them know what information it is that you need. I can't tell you how many times I see grantees are calling, you know, the day before their capers due, and it's like, okay, so how many did you do, and what did you do, where's the national, you know. It's a little late at that point. Uh, you should have been collecting this information long before that, okay? All right. Eligible cost, so this was a question that was brought up uh, a little earlier as well. So what is eligible? And one of them was operation and maintenance of the facility. Uh, as long as it is in the facility where those services are being provided, okay? So quite often we will see uh, a public service agency that may have you know, multiple rooms and they, they provide daycare as an example. And they have other rooms, they have offices, they have Really, you're, what you're doing is you're focusing where those services are being provided. This is, this is a daycare room. We can replace the carpeting, we can paint, we can do all of those types of things, okay? But we can't go and paint and re-carpet the president's office, okay? It's where the services are being uh, provided, where they occur. Um, we can provide labor, we can provide supplies, we can pay for material. Um, Again, the cost must be directly related to the, the eligible activity, and it must be documented, okay? So what types of, of uh, what do you fund with your CDBG dollars? Anybody? Salaries? Operating costs, okay. Any improvement, materials, supplies, okay. So there's a variety of things that you guys are funding, correct? Yes? Uh, for salary, we're, we're just starting the public service component of ours. Um, one of the applications, they already have a nonprofit in place and they already have salaried staff. 
they're requesting some of the salary based on the new program that they're trying to apply for. So do we prorate salary based on the actual operational costs due to that activity? Or do we in include their entire salary even though they've already been? <laughs> Neither of the two. <laughs> And so we'll talk about that tomorrow, but one option is if they have a cost allocation plan, you know, you can use that initially to establish what that prorating is. But most, most nonprofits, unless they're huge, don't have a cost allocation plan. So what, and even if they do have a cost allocation plan, they are required to keep timesheets. Yeah. And you're reimbursing dollar for dollar. So they work an hour, it's a salary, you can pay for benefits, you know, portions of the benefits, or whatever that prorated amount, and that's what you reimburse them, okay? Uh, but it's based on actual hours worked, and they must maintain timesheets. That is probably the number one finding that HUD makes with public, when they're monitoring public service agencies at the cities, the grantees are not collecting, not reviewing, um, timesheets and even even for grantees grantees are horrible at keeping timesheets of hours worked um, you can't prorate okay all right um, so here's here's another one of my best practices how many of you actually fund multiple parts of a public service agency where you're paying for supplies you're paying for labor you're paying for improvements you're paying for okay and quite often, the level of assistance is $10,000, and they're spending $2,000 on supplies, they're spending $7,000 on labor, and they're spending another $1,000 on some improvements, right? So as a result, they're having to keep timesheets for your program, okay? They are now having to procure for the supplies, possibly, okay? They are now having to implement Davis Bay, possibly. Okay. Starting to combine so many different things. The administrative costs associated with that have just skyrocketed. Okay. Best practice. Look at what it is that they're doing and try to limit it to one or two at the most of those elements. If you know that the amount of work that they're putting in, the labor portion, um, they have a full-time uh, daycare uh, person, and that salary can cover the entire grant, that's the easiest thing to document, okay? It's a simple timesheet. And then they're providing you with you know, their uh, documentation of fringe benefits, they're putting it into a table that says here's what I need to be reimbursed and you're getting this every whatever it is their pay period is every month or so right and what are you reviewing you're reviewing a timesheet and they're only preparing a timesheet when you start implementing you know improvements now subrecipients are fantastic at what they do they provide services that it's amazing you know, I've seen cases where I just, I'm in awe of what they do. One of the things they don't do well is paperwork. Right? right. Okay. This one is uh, an interesting one that uh, some grantees are not familiar with. So, all of you go through some type of an application process. Right? For public services, they submit an application. And occasionally, you're going to be funding a new agency, correct? If you are funding a new agency, it must comply with this slide. Okay? And it says, the service must be either a new service or a quantifiable increase in the level of an existing service that has been provided by the grantee or another entity on its behalf with local government funding or funding from the state or local government in the 12 months preceding the action plan submission. Okay? Um, 
So if you, the grantee, quite often uh, you may have programs that you're implementing, right? We have, uh, for example, a Fit for Kids program in one of the, the cities that we, we assist. They can't suddenly be implementing a program in which their own local government or state funds are being used and suddenly decide we don't want to use our own general fund money, we want to use CDBG money, so we're going to supplant it, we're going to switch it. You cannot do that unless it's an, a quantifiable increase in the services. So let's say that we use that same example. And um, the Fit for Kids typically assists 60 kids, 60 youth, and we provide $10,000 a year. And suddenly they're applying for CDBG and they're saying, look, we're now going to do 80. We're going to do 20 more and we're requesting $8,000. Okay, you, know, you can do that, but you can't pay for the, the original 60, you know, supplanting money to cover those costs so that it frees up general fund money as an example for that activity. Okay? So just make sure that when you are funding new agencies or uh, agencies that fall under this category, you, you're implementing that, that process. Okay. Find a new agency, uh, obviously is someone you haven't worked with before, but what if it's you funded an agency and they've dropped out for a period of time with the CDBG program? Over 12 what? months. So 12 months is the threshold? 12 months, yeah. Okay. So let's, ineligible activities, like with everything else, we have eligible, we have ineligible activities. Uh, and there are some, so we're looking at income payments, except for um, we have uh, emergency grant payments, not to ex exceed three consecutive months. So that's like rental assistance, right? Utility payments, as long as it's no more than three months. The other requirement is that those, the payment doesn't go directly to the uh, recipient, it's going to, the utility company is going to the landlord, okay? Uh, no ongoing operations and uh, political activities are ineligible, and that applies to any federally funded program, okay? Um, religious activities, how many of you actually fund a religious organization for public services, okay? One, two, three, okay, suddenly the hands are popping up, okay. Not unusual. Uh, it is, an, it is uh, eligible under CDBG. Um, it may not, however, be used for any type of religious activities. There has to be a clear separation of the two. Now, it's a gray area in terms of what that separation is, okay? Because quite often, and the, the programs that I typically will see is a daycare facility, right? So number one, they cannot discriminate as to who goes to this daycare facility. It cannot be based on religion. They, they have to open it up to everybody. Number two, the people who work there in that service do, you know, they can't be, uh, there can't be a requirement that they must be of the same religious organization, okay? So you're really having to open this thing up. Number three, you can't preach and you can't promote your religion while, services, while you're providing the services. As an example, um, if you had a daycare facility, you can't at lunch tell the kids, okay, you know, we need to pray before we eat. You can't do that, okay? Um, we know that, you know, sometimes you'll have stuff on the walls regarding, you know, your, that particular religion, and so that's fine as long as they are not promoting it, okay? So it gets into these, these gray areas. They can't be, you know, giving out flyers to the kids to say, you know, hey, come to church on Sunday, come to, you know, 
temple, come to whatever it may be. Uh, so there has to be that separation. Agreement must contain language to that effect. Very important. Um, okay. Also, you can do minor repairs to that particular, if we're doing that daycare facility, we can do some minor repairs, but it has to be specifically to that area where those, those services uh, are being provided, okay? That program income, okay? There are some exceptions. Uh, so are there, is there anybody in the audience that's a 1982-1983 grant? Maybe I'll ask the question a little differently. Anybody have a public service cap that's more than 15%? None. Amazing. Normally I'll have like two or three in the audience. So I, just real quickly, so if you are an 82-83 grantee, they may have been given when that original uh, agreement was signed, they may have, and I've heard as high as like 34% of their funds can actually go to public services, okay? And that stays on forever. Um, so I won't go into the details on that. But other exceptions, assistance to microenterprises. So if you are assisting microenterprise where you're actually providing uh, technical assistance, it doesn't go into um, public service by selecting microenterprise as a matrix code, it'll automatically take it out of public service. So it won't, won't affect your cap. Uh, there's some job training placement services. If you're working with a CHODO, um, I mean a CB, a community-based development organization, and they're doing some type of a job training uh, program, it is not considered a public service. Um, also, if you're doing it in a, a neighborhood revitalization strategy area or a community re redevelopment strategy area, it is also exempt from the public service cap. Okay. So here's kind of the, the formula or calculation for uh, public service cap. Real simple, we kind of went through some of this yesterday with admin. We have our entitlement amount of a million dollars. We have program income of 100,000. So our total uh, available uh, funds is 1.1 million multiplied by 15%. Uh, $165,000 can be used for public services. So we look at the cap compliance calculation. We look at how the amount of CDBG funds that were expended on a public service during program year. We spent 115,000, and this is where it gets a little confusing for some people. So we look at the second line says plus amount of unliquidated obligations at the end of the program year. And we also say minus unliquidated obligations at the end of the preceding program year. How many of you work with IDIS? Great. <coughs> You're going to understand this very easily. So let's just assume you have a June 30th or July 1st through June 30th program year, right? Your public service agency, I'm just going to use that as an example. They are, their contract runs through the same period. You do not receive an invoice for the last payment amount till probably sometime in the middle of July. Is that correct? Okay. So in IDIS, uh, what do you have to do when you finally, you're going to probably end up making a payment end of August, I mean uh, end of July, sometime in August, right? Technically, you're now in the next year, right? So what do you do in IDIS to say, actually, this is last year's payment? You flag it, right? You flag it as a prior year expense. So that's an unliquidated uh, expense that you still have on the books, right? At the end of the program year. 
So what you're doing is you're taking that amount and you are adding it to this year because you still have those payments that are due and you're subtracting the ones that you made at the beginning of this year, you're subtracting those because they're not this year's expenditures, they're technically last year's expenditures, correct? So that's kind of what that is trying to tell you, okay? Be aware of that. And the reason, the reason I say this is if you don't do it that way, if you don't flag it, what happens to your PR 26 at the end of the year? It comes out with, hey, I spent 18% on my public service. But how is that? I, I have contracts. That's all I paid on, right? But we forgot to flag it. So that's the first thing you'll notice. If, if you're at over 15% and all you did was fund at 15%, you have to go back and, and revise those vouchers to make sure that it flags it to the prior year. The problem is you have until September 28th to make those, those edits. Otherwise, at that point, it's fixed, and now you have to go in and do, uh, you have to write in why it's, it's in excess, et cetera, and make a manual adjustment. Okay. This brings up something for me, like, I, I'm very familiar with IDIS at home, but not CDBG, okay. and I've been working with it, and I've looked at that PR26, and it's showing I'm over 20% on my admin. So how do I, and I guess it's because of this, Right. But, you know, we're not overdrawing what we've set aside. Exactly. However, it's showing something else. So this is going to generate a call from my HUD rep, and I'm going to need to correct it somehow? Or? Well, so here, here's, and, and I was going to mention this tomorrow, but I'll mention it today. <laughs> okay. One of the things you all have to understand when you talk to your HUD rep on IDIS, your screens are not what they see on their screens. Okay? Their screens are completely different. So when you say, well, uh, so I'm looking at this and I'm seeing this, 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 you're speaking foreign language to them. That's not what they see, okay? So it's, don't be surprised that they can't provide you with an answer. But one of the beauties is we have the AAQ system where you can actually go into the HUD Resource Exchange and enter your question into the AAQ pool specifically for IDIS. They should be responding to your question within two days. I know that I'm part of the AAQ team for DRGR and we're given like 24 hours to respond. Okay, we have to at least touch base with you, what's the issue, and then we'll be communicating, we'll be on the phone. We have the ability to use WebEx or one of those systems where we'll say, okay, log in and I want to see your screen. And now I'm able to see what you're doing and I'll be able to guide you, do this, do that, do that, do that, okay? Uh, but it's a great resource to have. So everybody who, um, you know, irrelevant of what it may be, there are, uh, there is assistance available to you through, through the AAQ system, okay? Yeah, um, and the, the beauty is that they have access to reports so in advance of probably calling you, they will run reports and they'll know, oh, uh, got it. But give them a good description and if you have screenshots like the PR26, it's easier if you send it to them because they will know how to um, research it and try to figure out what, what's wrong, okay? Okay, okay. Uh, last slide. I believe it's the last slide, yeah, okay. So what, what national objectives can we use for public services? So we talked about LMA yesterday, right? Lomont area and we had to do a couple of tests, right? One of them is, is a service offered to everyone. So when we talk about public services, most public services are, are not offered to everyone, right? However, there are some. How many of you may do, for example, a, a graffiti removal program? That's technically a public, uh, a public service activity. 
And you can do that on an area basis. Okay. Um, you can also use slum blight area. Slum blight spot is not allowed. And urgent need is possible, but rare. Okay. Uh, 